Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to all those who are here present as well as uh, online uh, participants and listeners. Um, this is the first in the series of centenary lectures in the memory of Professor M.S. Swaminathan. We thought that since we are entering the centenary year from uh, now, and it will continue till August uh, 2025, which will be actually the 100th uh, birth anniversary. We would launch this in his memory and to commemorate his legacy. So every month we plan to invite a very eminent speaker from anywhere in the world, could be India, could be outside, uh, to speak about any topic in which they have expertise, but which is connected to the work that Professor Swaminathan had done. And if possible, to have uh, had a personal connection and relationship with him. And of course, there are so many areas where he worked and so many global and national institutions that he helped to nurture and develop that there's indeed a, a lot of possibilities uh, for us to have very good uh, speakers. So we're looking forward to that, and we're extremely uh, happy to have uh, Professor Ronnie Kaufman deliver the opening, the first uh, centenary lecture today, which is uh, October 3rd, 2024. Um, my colleague, Dr. Gayatri, will introduce uh, Dr. Ronnie Kaufman in more detail, but I'm very happy to have launched this uh, this uh, centenary lecture series, and I hope that it can be widely disseminated because of the quality of the speakers that we're going to have. So not only are we um, having an audience on Zoom, but we will be recording this lecture and putting it on YouTube, of course, with the permission of the speaker, so that we can have many more people, um, we can have the lecture reach a much larger audience um, globally. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaufman, for uh, being here in person today. We are very fortunate that we have our first lecturer in person with us here in Chennai. He has just completed two weeks at the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University as the first Professor M.S. Swaminathan <coughs> professor at large that was established. Again, it was an initiative uh, established last year um, to have, again, a professor of eminence from different parts of the world come and spend time at TNAU to interact with faculty and students over a period of time uh, to have both formal and informal interactions and to share the expertise and particularly to, to develop uh, uh, research interest and to guide students as they're thinking about uh, ideas for future research. So it's indeed a great uh, honor and, and pleasure to have you with us today. And I request Gayatri now to make an introduction to the speaker. So morning, everybody, uh, uh, those in the audience here and online. So delighted to have uh, Professor Kaufman here. He's, uh, he's, been in, he's been associated with the Cornell University for a very long time, where he earned his PhD degree also from under the guidance of Professor Norman Borlaug. He's an esteemed professor of plant breeding and genetics at Cornell's University College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, CALS. He's also currently the vice chair of the uh, Borlaug Global Rust Initiative and has held many uh, positions in his career, including director of international programs and associate dean for research at CALS. So he's also an honored fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he received it in 2019. And he's also been associated with many breeding programs, including rice uh, with Iri, and also he's worked with uh, many groups in Africa. So I think what he's presenting is a sum total of all of his experiences. And he'll be talking about essential adaptation to climate change through plant breeding, and uh, also probably including a tribute and, his, and talk about his association with Professor Swaminathan and Borlaug, since this is also an important component of uh, why we are having this lecture series. So glad to have you here, sir. Please. Uh. Well, <coughs> thank you for that uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. I, uh, it's really a, 
an honor and a, it was a, in the beginning an, an honor to be the first uh, um, professor at large at TNAU and now you invited me to do the inaugural centenary lecture so it's a, sort of a double honor. I, I uh, noticed the introduction saying I had been associated with Cornell University for a very long time. And I, I said to my colleague here, they've been saying my association has been there for a very, they've been saying that for a very long time. So, you know, it's kind of exponential by now. But let me get started here. What I want to do today is first, you know, provide a brief tribute to uh, Dr. Swaminathan, who, uh, you know, and, and, and Dr. Borlaug. I, got to know Dr. Swaminathan through Dr. Borlaug. So uh, that's my first point. Then I want to start talking about plant breeding and the importance of it to adapt to climate change, especially talk about productivity, total factor productivity. I don't know if we, I'm a little nervous, there might be an economist in the audience, but, but uh, anyway, I think it's important, it's important for plant breeders to understand what it is and to substantiate the need for a vigorous public plant breeding sector uh, to improve uh, total factor productivity discuss the implications of globalization and these disruptive uh, technologies that are coming at us at a pretty rapid speed and then talk about the advantages of adapting to climate climate change through plant breeding, including some of the emerging opportunities. And finally, try to portray the future of plant breeding in the context of climate change and, and especially uh, artificial intelligence. So, you know, you all know more about Dr. Swaminathan than, than I do. Uh, the, but let me just emphasize the big hallmark in his career that he and Dr. Borlaug, who are pictured in the, in the center here back in, back in the 1960s, I reckon that photo would have been made. And I think they, you know, they did something together that probably neither of them could have, could have done alone. And that was that between 1964 in 1968, they doubled the yield of wheat in India. Just imagine that, you know, wheat had been grown in this region for what? Uh, 40 centuries since Mohenjo-daro, you know, we know it, it had been grown. And, in, you know, so, so what had been done in 40 centuries was done again in four years. So it's absolutely amazing what, what the two of them achieved together. And, you know, I was uh, around Dr. Borlaug a lot in my younger years. And then again, uh, uh, well, throughout his whole career after I got to know him, but mostly in, in, in being trained under him as his, his PhD student, his only PhD student. And he would talk a lot about Dr. Swaminathan. And, you know, I think he, he felt when he received the, I was in the field with him when he received the Nobel Prize. And I, I think he felt strongly that, you know, Dr. Swaminathan should have, should have been a partner. What, what, what drove him to establish the World Food Prize was so that he could really acknowledge what Dr. Swaminathan contributed uh, to, to that effort. So he had, you know, really tremendous respect, as did so many of us, for Dr. Swaminathan. So I spent, you know, four, about 40 years with Dr. Borlaug. That's me there in the, in the left side. <coughs> when I still had, I was 26 years old or something and I still had hair as you can 
uh, see. That's my, that photo. You know, I, we, I don't have many photos from that era because, you know, a 35 millimeter camera back in the 1960s was worth a lot of money and a graduate student couldn't afford one. And so I don't have many photos, but this photo was taken at my final exam for the PhD and it, it was it was more like a press conference than a final exam because Dr. Borlaug came to town to participate in the exam. He came to Ithaca for the exam. And, you know, the press came from uh, all over, from Syracuse, some from New York City, uh, just to interview him. And so they kept uh, interrupting. So I didn't really mind, you know, they, they graduated me. So <laughs> it, was, it was a fairly, uh, e e easy uh, day uh, for me. And then we, you know, I was with him toward, toward the end of his career when we did together the Borlaug uh, Global Rust Initiative. And, uh, you know, Dr. Borlaug, I wish I had more pictures of him with Dr. Swaminathan. There's some here from from India, but they're mostly in the Punjab, where he, he was early focused with, with wheat. And but he, he, you know, he would always say to us, uh, more than any other expression, take it to the farmer. His focus was, was always the farmer, and I have always remembered that, as have, I think, most people who, were ever, associated with him. So, coming to plant breeding, you know, we had a famous astronomer at Cornell by the name of Carl Sagan. Some of you who are, uh, have a few years of experience might remember him talking about the billions. He had a very deep voice and he would talk about the billions and billions of this and that in outer space. So he used to say that, you know, if you're gonna bake an apple pie, you had to first create the universe. So I've modified that to say, if you want to explain plant breeding from scratch, you have to first create the universe. So let's, let's get, I want to explain plant breeding to you, maybe in a way you have never heard it portrayed, but you know, in the context of our greater society, what, what does it do? And I think it's important for us as plant breeders and associated scientists to you know, uh, communicate this. So imagine yourself, you know, way out in space, a million light years, and uh, you know the our solar system. Uh, well, our galaxy is just a sort of a glow uh, in the in the very far distance. And imagine you come in an order of magnitude to a million light years and you can see the galaxy and where the Earth is located. And then I'm not gonna do the order of magnitude, I'll jump a few orders and come into 100,000 uh, uh, kilometers where you can you know, begin to see the real uh, outline, the blue marble uh, of the Earth. And if you come on in to t by an order of magnitude to 10,000 kilometers and 1,000 kilometers, I'm sorry this is gonna zero in on Andra instead of time, because that's where I first did it, but you know, I didn't have time to change it. So, so the Earth at 100 kilometers, at 10 kilometers, and then what do you see? Well, you see fields. They're kind of sparse in Andra, but they're what we call fields. But what are they really? What they really are, are biological solar panels you know, we live on this third rock from the Earth, and this is the way we get our energy from the sun. And what plant breeders do is improve the elements in those solar panels. That's what we do. And that, in my opinion, is a real contribution to total factor productivity because we, you know, without 
So total factor productivity, let's just discuss what that is. It reflects the total economic cost of production, you know, without subsidies or anything. Uh, it raises output per unit input. That can be like per hectare, per worker, per unit of water, uh, reducing inputs per unit of output, or adding value at con with constant prices. So, so plant breeding contributes to all of that by, you know, manipulating the elements that collect radiant energy from the sun. So it's, you know, my case is it's a essential public private investment. And there's a new study out by USDA that in fact, you know, total factor productivity is the major driver of output growth. And if you look closely at this, uh, this slide, the light green area are the changes in productivity. You go back to the 1960s, you don't see much, but just imagine Swaminathan and Borlaug's contribution to the productivity of wheat by the fact that through plant breeding, they doubled it, doubled what had been there for the past 40 centuries. So that was probably the first really huge contribution. And we've gone on since then to add this amount of productivity to output growth. Uh, and I think we need to really recognize that and focus on it uh, as, as plant breeders. So here's, you know, land area has remained virtually constant for the last several decades. But genetic uh, technology and management, this is mostly genetics, has added greatly to the uh, production and the productivity. So this is a summary then, a vigorous plant breeding sector is required to adapt to climate change because it increases this conversion of solar energy to increase total factor productivity. It reduces the costs, both monetary and environmental, of plant protection, uh, insecticides, fungicides, and so forth. Uh, effective plant breeding reduces that a lot. It adds value for quality, sensory, nutritional factors. It helps enhance the production of biofuels and improve the sustainability of agricultural systems. So the threat of climate change, let's just talk about it a minute. What's happening? You see this kangaroo uh, riding a bale of hay in Australia. That's a real photo. Uh, but you see this graph, and I hope you, it's a little dim, but what this is are, you know, one-year portrayals beginning in 1940 at the bottom and each year since 1940 uh, portrays a, a year going across the bottom. So what's happened recently? Look at what happened last year, the tremendous increase. And then the beginning of this year, it started off high. I don't have the data to know where it's finishing, but I'm thinking it's finishing high. So we really have a tremendous problem with temperature rising. And uh, these, these are the trends in land and ocean temperature. I'm sure you know that it's getting the, the, the change is greater uh, in the polar regions than it is at the uh, lower latitude. But, you know, the, the significance is it's getting hotter. This is causing 
Right now, we have a tremendous, I don't know if you keep up with any of the U U.S. news, but we just had a hurricane that went into the eastern mountains of North Carolina. Incredible damage, just absolutely incredible. People, you know, those are little valleys where the road is always built along the side of the stream. That's the only place you can build a road. And it rained in those areas up to 30 inches in a matter of a couple of days, 30 inches. So it just, you know, tore through that region. And it's, you know, that's happened in, it's happened in Eastern Europe quite recently. It, uh, these, these pictures here are from uh, Germany a, a couple of years ago when I first uh, I made this slide. We have raging fires in California. So I think there's very little argument about the changes that are taking place. The permafrost is probably one of the most dangerous thing, things that is happening. And, you know, no one really thinks about talking about it. But uh, I understand that President Putin is actually importing American cowboys to, you know, graze cattle in these areas that used to be uh, permafrost. The pastures are opening up in, in Central Asia. It's, it's really quite amazing. So climate change is real. And generally, they tell us that rainfall will increase because the hot air holds more water. It'll decrease in lower latitudes, increase in higher latitudes. But, you know, an important thing is there's going to be a lot more variance and major changes are going to occur in the distribution of plant diseases and insect pests. So just an example, heat versus wheat. You know, I've worked pretty closely with CIMIT and they've been running uh, trials for some years and their conclusion is that for every one degree centigrade rise in night night temperature wheat yield is reduced by a metric ton per hectare this is really quite a, a serious thing so you know we're already uh, in trouble uh, with wheat rice you know rice well in this uh, state half of humanity eats it it's threatened by heat by drought by flooding by salinity by diseases and pests these big river deltas this is the mekong you know uh when in the introduction uh, you, you said i've been working or, or it became clear i've been working quite a while well i first saw the mekong in river in 1972 and it was all rice now 50 years later what has happened you can still see some rice there on the right but on the left in that big horseshoe bend of the river it's flooded obviously so you might just think it's flooded out from the saline water pushing up through there and that's true but what they're doing in that saline water is growing shrimp and making a lot of money, actually. So, you know, in some ways there can be positive things. Farmers in that region are making more money growing and selling shrimp than they were growing and selling rice. But it's, it's frightening what sea rise means for rice cultivation. I was just talking to one of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Harry Hiron, uh, about what he's doing. It's, you know, really, really interesting work in coping with salinity tolerance in these big uh, uh, coastal uh, delta areas. So challenges for plant breeding in society. You have the globalization of agriculture, privatization of you know, major crops, these multinational seed companies, 
international trade, international flow of labor, social resistance to some of the technologies, uh, climate change impact on the developing world, the automation of agriculture and plant breeding, um, alternate sources of animal protein. That looks like a, you know, a change that could really affect uh, U.S. agriculture, which is, you know, produces corn and soybeans, which are mainly used to feed uh, poultry and other uh, livestock. And importantly, you know, we need to do a better job of communication of the fundamental societal need for plant breeding, for adapted genotypes <coughs> that are based on the, you know, the value of these technologies that that we've uh, we've developed. I like to show a, a you know, a single seed uh, the potential that it is there for, you know, modifying the code in a single seed is really extraordinary. But crop improvement has changed more in the past 20 years than at any time since the discovery of genetics. And it continues to change. I've probably been saying that for 20 years. You know, it's really changing fast. It's driven by discoveries in biology and information technology. It's accelerated by laws protecting or, uh, or, or patenting biological material. And it's going to be catalyzed by artificial intelligence. So how will AI, artificial intelligence, impact plant breeding? A few big companies and perhaps a few large universities have a comparative advantage in the form of very large proprietary databases that they have on performance. If you take some of the big uh, companies, they've been you know, testing throughout the world for decades. Uh, and they have access to extraordinary computing capacity, which is essential. So we need to think seriously about what that implies. Here's a graph of the changes in computing capacity. And it just keeps going, you know, still doubling every 18 months or so. It's actually quite amazing. They, they measure it in, in flops and it's grown to a level of 140,000 trillion flops. So, you know, such is the demand for computing power that the chair of Microsoft has suggested to the U.S. government that they should reopen Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island is a nuclear power plant that was closed down maybe 20 years ago because of some, uh, uh, well, social pressure and maybe real hazards. But he's saying that, you know, that kind of power will need, be needed uh, for the computers to drive artificial intelligence. I think we, we really have a lot to learn about what's going to happen with, with artificial intelligence. So that, you know, people who think deeply about this subject, about artificial intelligence, haven't, they have not thought about plant breeding, uh, but they have thought generally about it, about AI and its likely impact on any field of endeavor. And what they say is that the likelihood is that state-of-the-art activity will coalesce in just a few places, just a few, you know. So you have to ask yourself, you know, if you're situated wherever, will, will this be one of them? And the answer is probably not. Uh, you know, I can say at Cornell, 
we might be one of them. Uh, we have, you know, one of the five great supercomputers in the country, but I don't know if in the fullness of time it can compete with what may, you know, coalesce in other locations. So whoever comes along with this capacity uh, is going to prevail. And we have, a, we have a lot to learn about the implications, a lot to learn about we should be think, you should be thinking about, you know, what will be relevant partnerships if this kind of thing happens. We, we, we all should be uh, thinking because it's an incredibly, incredibly uh, challenging thing. So, but you can't, you know, we don't want to overlook the fact that you can't understand in a lab how technology and society are going to evolve. We, we have the, you know, the experience already to say that uh, there can be a lot of social resistance to these uh, technologies. We, we limit, while I was at TNAU, we lamented about the BT eggplant, you know. 20 years ago, we tried to deploy it at, in Tamil Nadu, uh, in uh, Karnataka, and in Bangladesh, and we, and in Maharashtra, uh, but we only succeeded ultimately in Bangladesh. And it's working. It works great. And it's leaking over into India. I don't know how much or exactly where, but I know it's happening. And you know, it really, that's because it really works. It really does work. And, it, and it's absolutely of no danger to, to uh, human beings. And it, you know, eliminates the fruit and shoot borer as a damaging insect on uh, eggplant. So it's a shame that didn't work, but we can only uh, uh, try again. What we can say, you know, so we can't understand, we can't predict what the pushback will be, and we can say that AI is still not good at reasoning, but it's, you know, superhuman in terms of global knowledge. It, it, it can access your data and do tasks that you could never do, never could the human mind get around what uh, AI can do and learn with uh, these large volumes of data that are available to it. So what are the consequences of these changes? Concerns that expansive patenting may inhibit the involvement of the public sector and jeopardize contributions to the welfare of people. Concerns that a few companies may gain control of the global food system. You know, companies like Syngenta, Bayer, Corteva. And then, of course, there's fear of biodiversity exploitation. What about AI and copyright? That's complicated. You know, a lot of opponents, like the New York Times, for instance, New York Times has filed a law site lawsuit saying, you know, AI does not have the right to learn from the New York Times. And uh, the proponents are saying that if humans can read the internet and learn, then AI should be able to read the internet and learn. So, you know, I've asked sort of sarcastically, will AI success successfully defend AI? I, I, I think there are a lot of answers that we we, we really don't know. So trends in crop improvement. Private sector breeders are increasing, public sector breeders decreasing, which is unfortunate. We should, you know, all do our best to do something about that. Public sector is not producing finished cultivars. Public resources are diverted to basic science. Climate change is definitely more challenging. Transgenic crops are expanding. Edited cultivars are expanding, alternate approaches to protein production, and public skepticism 
is significant, but you know, lately it's been improving. So genomics, we're all aware of it. It's an ongoing revolution comparable to physics in the last century. All genes encoding most major life forms are being revealed. It's a major paradigm shift in biological research. So I'm not going to get into the details of genomics except to say that we are using it to improve cassava in Africa. We have had this project now for just over 10 years, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You know, cassavas are really what breeders have always called a recalcitrant crop. You know, it's vegetatively propagated. It's genetically very heterogeneous. So you cross two desirable cultivars, but it just, you know, doesn't give you anything. It just throws a bunch of junk. Uh, and um, so we can get around that with the uh, phenotype, <coughs> with sequencing individual plants, using those data to plan crosses, we've been able to get 10% a year genetic gain over the past 10 years or so. So it's really working, so much so that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has identified this program as one of the five things that make them optimistic about Africa. So we're quite proud of that, and uh, we should all be aware that Genomic selection does work, uh, and uh, we need the resources to apply it more broadly. I mentioned the uh, BT fruit and shoot borer resistant eggplant, and you know that represents a whole category of, of uh, technology that we should be using more effectively, but society uh, has made it a challenge for us. Genome editing is coming. I know some of you are, are uh, utilizing it here successfully. I think it has a, a great future and there's real hope that the social resistance to it will be a lot less than, than it has been to transgenics. So thinking of the past, plant breeding has accounted for more than half the gains in production in agriculture in this century. Success was based on an implicit contract that genetic resources were public and available to anyone. But over the past several years, the rules have changed. You know, in some cases you have kind of draconian institutions that have emerged to protect biodiversity and, and they're really getting in the way of the exchange of germplasm and productive uh, plant breeding. Imagine, you know, what would have happened back in the days of Swaminathan and Borlaug if we had had this kind of constraint, you know. Dr. Swaminathan first saw Dr. Borlaug's varieties in an international rust nursery up in Wellington, uh, a station that Dr. Swaminathan helped to contribute uh, or, or uh, establish, I, I believe. So, Back then, you know, we exchanged, I, I became a rice breeder after training with Dr. Borlaug. We set up the international rice testing program. We exchanged germplasm freely with everyone, everywhere in, in Asia. Now, that's a very challenging thing to do. So I think it's, it's something we need to reflect on and improve if we can. So the future. First, plant breeding will integrate fully with agricultural research specifically and with biological engineering and medical research generally. You're gonna have an interdependent public-private sector and plant breeding will be a primary force in adapting to climate change. The public sector will be the dominant partner for training the private sector will be the dominant partner for research. The private sector will continue to consolidate. 
new startups like Pairwise is one that I'm familiar with in the U.S. Uh, it's doing transgenics for fresh uh, vegetables. So new startups may be more frequent, especially for fruit and vegetable crops. The public sector will increasingly partner with the private sector, halves I call them. And these are the big companies. And they'll find it challenging to serve the have-nots. Uh, adaptation to climate change will require increasing attention from plant breeders. AI may lead to further consolidation due to the enormous computing requirements that we talked about earlier. So the winners and losers, consumers may enjoy lower food prices. For seed companies, size will matter. Uh, producers may suffer as more value is added through genetic technology and less through management. But companies may assist with management, particularly data management. So, you know, I think we've not seen anything yet. Uh, the uh, gene editing, gene drive, all this, CRISPR really has, I think, a lot of potential for a lot of crops. Uh, so in summary, plant breeding is essential to ensure the adaptation to climate change, an improved economy and strengthened employment through increased exports are among the advantages of adapting crops. Communicating, you know, Dr. Borlaug and Dr. Swaminathan, they were both in their own way really effective communicators. I've more frequently observed Dr. Borlaug, you know, he could compute, could communicate with anybody. I mean, he's famous for communicating with politicians, but he never passed up a chance. You know, you go to the field with him and first thing you know, you say, where's Borlaug? Well, he's over talking to the boy that scares off the birds, you know, and spends the whole day in the field. He's chatting him up and he's finding out what goes on around there and, uh, you know, making a friend of him. He, he, he was really a, an amazing man. So communicating is, is a real fundamental need that all of us as scientists really need to uh, do a better job at. Uh, so shaped by unprecedented technological and economic forces, change is accelerating and automation is moving especially fast. Interdependence is increasing between the public and private sector. Interdependence is increasing among nations for access to genomic technologies for crop improvement. International partnerships are essential for access to germplasm, but it's very challenging to implement them uh, right now. So climate change, will demand increased attention from plant breeders to address the challenges that we've discussed. Drought, flooding, salinity, diseases and pests, increasing cost of water. You know, when I was a student, the risk was calculated by hazard times exposure. That was what we were taught was the risk. Now, it's hazard times the media exposure equals the perception of risk, right? That's the way it's working. So, you know, my, my final, I guess, you know, Borlaug, I think, was our greatest example of what I would call a man on message. He, he could really, you know, speak to anybody about the science he was doing. Uh, you all are too young to remember it, but in the day, you know, when those short statured varieties came out, people were just as suspicious of those things as they are of today's modern technologies. They thought it was just, you know, not right that wheat should be that short. Something must be wrong with it, you know. Will it make you sterile or whatever? You know, I, I was with Borlaug once 
in Pakistan at a press conference and a, a guy asked him, you know, a, a newspaper person asked him, is it true, Dr. Borlaug, that these uh, varieties will make you sterile? And Borlaug, he was very frustrated, you know. He said, I wish the hell it would, <laughs> which solved the population problem. <laughs> so he was a great, he was a great communicator, and I think we should all take that as an example and, and do our best to, uh, to uh, explain our science and explain the needs uh, that society has for these technologies. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to take some questions if there are some. Uh, th thank you, Professor, for that uh, uh, lecture. And there were parts of it, uh, some of us felt like getting up and cheering <laughs> you on. <laughs> anyway, uh, two questions, uh, two quick questions. Uh, you mentioned total factor productivity growth. Uh, one of the things that came out from the IPCC's sixth assessment report on adaptation is that the only region of the world that has shown a steady decline in total factor productivity growth is Africa. In fact, total factor productivity, I think, if I remember correctly, has an absolute decline. So would you like to comment on that because you are directly involved with efforts uh, at productivity in Africa. The second question, a uh, little removed in a different direction, you spoke about draconian institutions that uh, inhibit, uh, in the name of biodiversity, our opportunities to learn from each other. So I would like to know whether specifically you have any uh, issues that you would like to flag with the uh, in the CBD, what they are doing with the Kunming Montreal Declaration, are there issues there you think that we need to relook at or uh, perhaps fine tune or tinker? The two questions. Thank you. Sure. Well, the Africa question is 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 a big challenge. You know. Uh, the soils of Africa are, are where you start. I used to have a, a, a Belgian soil scientist who was a good friend, and he would explain it to me this way. He would say, Ronnie, Africa is a big piece of granite that's been scratched up a little bit on top. <laughs> the, the soils are just, you know, not, not fertile except in the volcanic areas around the, the Great Rift, Ethiopia and Kenya, but Central Africa, West Africa, I could tell you all kinds of stories. You know, I've been closely involved with many organizations there. I helped select the site for the uh, moving, when the West Africa Rice Development uh, Association, WARDA, it's now called Africa Rice. When it came into the CG, I was asked to serve on the board and select the site for the new location. And so they gave me a team, and one of them was a soil scientist. And we were visiting different stations, and we went to Liberia. And I was tied up, I had to see uh, someone one morning, so I sent the soil scientist out to evaluate uh, this station that uh, was buying for headquarters of WARDA. So he, he was from Hawaii, you know, he, he was used to nice organic, I mean, uh, 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 volcanic soils. So he comes back in that evening, I said, how did it go? He said, well, it was a little embarrassing. He said, we drove out, we got out of the vehicle, and I said, this is a really nice all-weather road you have here. And they said, sir, this is the field. <laughs> that, that's the laterite clay that forms when you take, you know, the, the, the vegetation off of it. it it's, it's just really, challenging. You see people, you know, planting things like 
bananas there and they deal they dig all the way through the a horizon all the way down to the b and and they plant the root in, in the b because that's the only place it can get any nourishment you know so so the soils are a big uh, challenge in in africa and you know you you can do things with lime and fertilizer uh, you can you can mitigate it, but you have to haul those uh, commodities into Central Africa. It's very expensive, so it's really perplexing uh, what to do. I, I think I don't think we know quite what to do. <laughs> is is the is the honest uh, answer? You. One thing you could do, especially where you have a water, and that is considerable parts of West Africa, is you could grow more rice. If you flood a soil, that brings, you know, these soils have very low pH and it ties up the phosphorus and so forth. If you flood a soil, the, the pH is brought to close to neutral. And uh, you, you, you can grow a decent crop of rice. But, you know, the, the good land for irrigating is tied up by all of these complex uh, uh, societal situations, religious, like I have served as a consultant to governors of states in Nigeria who wanted to develop rice along the Niger River. So you go down to the river and your colleagues say, well, first, sir, we have to go and talk to the emir. We can't approach the river until we talk to the emir, you know, the religious commander of the, of the area. And then he allows you to go and look, but he's not going to allow you to do anything because, you know, he likes the status quo. Uh, so it's complex. I don't uh, have uh, easy, easy answers. I think what it, what really is happening in Africa is, you know, young people are moving to urban areas. They're using the internet. I mean, they get they they, they get pretty good education. They start getting uh, jobs on the internet you know, at a very low price. They're, they're very competitive for doing all kinds of things. So I don't know about the future of, of agriculture. I'm, I'm quite uh, pessimistic about it, to tell you the, the truth. But uh, I've done all I can to help train plant breeders, and I think we should do more. If you train a plant breeder in that region, you know, he or she will stay there and do their best throughout their entire career. If you bring them out of Africa to the U.S. and train them, they'll do their best to stay in the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, 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 that's, that's one thing clear. On the germplasm, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm 80 years old. I just, uh, you know, fondly remember the days when we could freely exchange and everybody was open and, and honest about it. I realize that some people have, uh, especially some private sector companies have probably abused that and so you, you need some kind of protection, but I think somehow we have overdone it and it's, uh, it's something that we should all, you know, keep in the front of our mind as, uh, as we move forward. And if, if, you, if you have one of these organizations that's protecting biodiversity, then, you know, encourage them to use common sense in, in their regulatory approach and make sure it's not interfering with, with uh, collaborative plant breeding. I think that's what we can do. Uh, thank you uh, again. Excellent talk, and I think there's so many 
issues you have raised, but I just want to, so I'm just going to mention uh, one question, comment. I think the AI, and you brought out, uh, you know, this tendency towards concentration and, you know, the AI right now is in private hands. I mean, even the internet originally developed, you know, through big public sector funding in the U.S., but then it's gone into private hands. And one thing I think that is very uh, important, particularly because there's a lot of talk about agriculture has to be the site of mitigation and you know, reduced energy use. But if you talk about AI and computing and what you mentioned about the nuclear energy, this is something we're not really talking about, that is a huge the same yeah. thing, I think, for the artificial foods, at least what I heard in a few talks when I was at Cornell was that plant-based meat, et cetera, are very energy intensive. So we, you know, we can't move, as you say, but from one extreme to the other. This seems to be a little uh, worrying. Yeah. And the, so it's, it's more a comment if you have anything. We don't have, I think, in AI today the kind of uh, public like even with plant breeding, as you're saying, there was a public initiative, and now it's increasingly, you know, particularly the profitable crops are in the private, private hands. And I think that's one of the things in Africa, these crops were not profitable for any of the big companies like soya or like the fruit and vegetable. Uh, how do we push for, because I think AI and plant breeding, the germplasm is still in, stored in some public institutions. And I know that ERI has partnered with Google or somebody to try and you know, look for characteristics in that germplasm through AI rather than you know, each one being taken out and tested. And you know, it's a huge time and effort saying. But can you think of, you have thought about this and raised a very important point. What are the kind of institutions we can start talking about or demanding which would ins at least allow some access uh, to AI uh, for, I mean, I'm not even talking about small farmers. I'm talking about organizations in the South or research institutes, you know, not even yeah. necessarily. What we think of as very large institutions yeah, yeah, now even, may, may, may be <laughs> fenced out. Yeah. And second thing is just a comment I wanted to make since we're sitting here and something I've been, you know, India has been a major rice uh, producer and has become a rice exporter now. And we have a big uh, uh, public debate about whether we are overproducing rice, and which I think is you know looking at it the wrong way. And we've also had you know in the last few years, like last July in particular, the government of India for some reason put a ban on exports of rice, non-basmati rice. So this is the you know not the super fine varieties going to sort of niche or you know more luxury markets to Dubai or the US or wherever. And when we looked at it, the major countries importing this are in Africa. So I think taking another sort of public goods perspective or a global perspective, countries that can produce also need to keep producing for other uh, countries. So I think this is something the need for you know, we don't just produce, eat local is becoming, I think, a uh, phrase which we've got to worry about. You know, not everybody, as you say, with these soils can eat local. Right. So I think uh, you've raised, I don't know, a lot of ideas, and I don't want to go on, but just yeah. wanted to comment on a few. Thank you. Yeah, I wish I had uh, all the answers to the issues I've, uh, I've raised. Uh, I, you know, I think, the AI thing is something quite imminent. I I don't know. It, it seems like it would take a whole new kind of of institution to deal with it. I mean, our experience shows that you know the private sector is going to really scramble to get in if there's profit to be made. I mean, that's just uh, clear. It's happened in with our major food crops. You know, it still hasn't happened with wheat because you can't make money growing wheat. It's, uh, uh, you know, 
you can you can do hybrid wheat but by the time you get your system set up for hybrid wheat the conventional breeding program has already surpassed the you know the hybrid vigor that you uh, originally planned to get and so it's not it's not uh, profitable pretty much the same is true of of rice so you know they probably aren't going to really get into wheat uh, and rice and uh, you know what you're talking about with the India uh, cutting off exports I mean that's that's a that's a global challenge the economists say well you know you should do what you're good at you know uh, not everybody's good at growing rice so you should buy rice if you can't grow it but uh, you know you tell that to somebody like even the rich uh, entities like Singapore you know they feel like the Singaporeans feel like they are really food insecure because they have no farms <laughs> and so they are keen on these new technologies if it's going to give them some some security they're really investing as you know and you can you can buy chicken nuggets uh, that are haven't seen a chicken you know in in Singapore uh, you already can get them if you can afford them they're not really uh, that affordable so what happens when when there's the least little scare about a shortage becomes a political issue and the government of every rice producing country cuts it off and that leaves you know many of the African countries and others uh, vulnerable I, I don't know how you can you know provide assurance that that won't happen both the poor countries and the rich countries that are not self-sufficient in rice are they feel vulnerable and they are vulnerable uh, let, 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 let's face it so I don't I don't have an answer to that one one thing I wish that economists would tackle is how to get rid of subsidies you know worldwide I mean you talk about total factor productivity you need to take the subsidies out well the US and Europe have big time subsidies and we are exporting these uh, food and feed grains all over the world uh, you know very large portions are produced in North and South America and shipped to this part uh, of the world so it's the subsidies are a real and that puts farmers here I mean you have it inside of India and you have it you know internationally it puts farmers at a big disadvantage when you're subsidizing a crop uh, it's a real uh, problem but one that's very hard to get around politically I can't say that we can you know if we tried to cut off subsidies to our farmers given our political situation in the United States it would just be chaotic you know people wouldn't put up with it there, there, there might be a civil war I don't know <laughs> it, it's it, it, it's it's really a challenge to cut those subsidies off and but but they're really a, a challenge for poor farmers everywhere if if the wealthy farmers are are subsidized and they shut down the, the poor farmers who are trying to make a living and and uh, grow 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 food and feed uh, locally also thank you for your wonderful lecture and uh, I'm here. Uh, could you please uh, uh, give your idea on uh, using genome editing technology on stacking multiple uh, um, abiotic stresses like uh, uh, salinity and drought uh, in uh, in the same crop, like uh, as they do for later genes of uh, for uh, the low glycemic index in rice. 
Somebody help me out there. Yeah, so I think the question was regarding using genome editing for abiotic stress. Uh -huh. Is that right, Nagalakshmi? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so that, what that is it that you want? Huh. Yes? That okay. is uh, taking genes of different drought tolerance and uh, salinity tolerant uh, uh, genes to single genotype like uh, millet. Okay, so uh, so you are saying that you want genome editing to be uh, used to enhance drought and salinity tolerance in millets. You want yes, you want him to comment on it? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah, thank you. Yes, generally, you know, it has a lot of potential for, say, uh, crops like millet uh, to improve uh, drought tolerance and and uh, productivity. It's it's quite a a powerful technology that breeders should use, uh, uh, you know, more more effectively. So, you know, we've used it for cassava. I think demonstrated the the potential for some of these crops that are really difficult to breed, and you know, I think it has potential for millet, which I know is a big focus here in India, uh, both. Uh, pearl millet, finger millet, all the millets, I reckon. So, I, I seems like wherever I go, there's a snack or something of millet, which is nice. I enjoy it. Um, so, I think to answer your question, I hope I'm answering it. Uh, I, I would be very supportive of using the technology to improve those crops. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your clarification. Thank yeah. you. Uh, this is. Uh couple of comments and first is related to your uh, answer to the uh, the problem with Africa. Uh, you, you did mention getting inputs, particularly fertilizers, into Africa is an extremely expensive affair and that's definitely one of the reasons why there is uh, such a low use of inputs in Africa. Now one of the solutions that is put forward to it is to use Africa's own resources. For example, there's a lot of gas. In, like especially in West Africa, off the coast of Nigeria, Liberia, and all of that, uh, Angola, maybe, uh, to exploit their own resources to produce uh, fertilizers within Africa. Now, this needs a lot of funding, both to develop and explore gas, and also to set up factories. Now, one of the issues that has happened over the years is that uh, international development agencies, US Treasury, uh, World Bank, they have come out with a unilateral notification uh, which, which uh, sort of denies all sort of funding for quote-unquote fossil fuel infrastructure in Africa, but it ultimately is not just fossil fuel. It has direct uh, sort of implication to food security in Africa. Now, that's, that's a problem. I mean, it's, one can look at it as an ethical and also an issue of you know, right to their carbon space. I mean, like a continent which has uh, contributed very little to gl like global warming and they're not able to use their own resources for their food security because they have to protect the planet. I mean, it sort of becomes a conundrum. Now, second uh, is uh, a little broader. One of the discourse, in fact, the most growing string of discourse when it comes to agriculture and sustainability or climate change is, is this discourse about you know alternative technologies such as agroecology or you know such kind of stuff, which is globally getting endorsed even by those institutions which once sort of stood for productivity growth, and you know including FAO, World Bank, um, even CGIR in particular places. Now these discourses are often rooted uh, at best they sort of show an indifference to productivity. Uh, or traditional sort of established agricultural science, or at worst, kind of hostility towards it, you know, in terms of uh, terming science has to be some, you know, uh, all of, you know, terming science completely in terms of political terms. Uh, now, how do, do we sort of reconcile this growing trend with the fact that we need more science and more technology and more infrastructure and more public infrastructure in agriculture? Thank you. Well, I hope uh, I hope I got the uh, question right there. I mean, you're you're right that 
locally produced fertilizers in Africa would would be a very desirable uh, outcome because if you could produce them locally then you wouldn't have to haul them these long distances. Uh, so there are technologies, for instance, uh, I'm the, I'm the uh, chair of the jury for the Borlaug Field Award, and we're awarding it this year to a young African scientist who has used the, is it the black soldier fly to produce these organic uh, fertilizers. And he's, you know, successfully, as I understand it, commercialized it in Kenya. So I hope something like that may have uh, potential throughout uh, all of Africa. And, uh, you know, speaking of that, I know that TNAU, uh, the director of research there, has an award from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for some similar uh, technology that they're working on. I don't, I don't know the details. It's not the soldier fly, but it's, but it's uh, similar. So that would be a very uh, desirable outcome. You know, I, I mean, your, your other comments, you know, raise some real dilemmas. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I have a, you know, the right answer for any of them, but maybe we can talk uh, af after lunch about uh, a little further, huh? I don't want to keep you too long, so let me know. Yeah, I, Professor. So one of your slides which where you're saying that uh, due to flooding, uh, the farmers have shifted to shrimp, clumped, uh, shrimp cultivation. So uh, like in context to that, uh, is there any limitations up to what extent we can adapt to climate change through plant breeding or shifting to a shrimp cultivation or animal-based dietary patterns, mostly in African and Indian subcontinent? Is this the answer? Like plant-based or animal-based dietary shifts uh, as a part of adaptation in the warming world? Uh, I'm not sure I got the question. The point is, is there a limit to how much you can do by way of plant breeding? Well, I'm... You have to shift completely out of ground into something else. Uh, to to you know, it's, it, it's hard to see how you can shift away, at this point, shift away from uh, crops, so I think, you know, a lot of emphasis on plant breeding to adapt the crops to the challenges of climate change. But I, you know, I don't, I'm not dismissive at all of the, of the technologies that are producing alternate proteins. You know, Africa in particular, they're very, uh, they do a lot of fermentation. So, you know, some of these new technologies emphasize uh, fermentation for the production of alternate proteins. And, you know, I, I, it's not my specialty. I don't know, you know, really how well they work or how well they could be made to work with, uh, with the proper attention. But, you know, I, I, I think it needs emphasis is my answer, yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, do we have to refocus our attention in plant breeding, especially related to the uh, climate change? Because climate change uh, is more important than earlier. Uh, our genetic, uh, uh, genetic research are mostly uh, around disease and pest control and also increasing income, increasing the yield. That was the more major focus of our genetic uh, but now, uh, due to climate change, we are we are being uh, we need drought tolerant varieties. Also, the varieties which are able to uh, withstand the water stagnation, also water submersion, this type of things. Do you think that genetic engineering itself it requires a refocus? Well, I don't see a you know a dramatic refocus because all of those things are still important. Um, Climate change is going to affect the diseases and pests and their incidence and maybe, you know, 
which ones are the uh, becoming more important. For instance, if you take a crop like wheat, you'll find that fusarium, scab, is becoming important. And you know, there's a there's a zero tolerance for it. It's a very serious thing. Uh, and it, you know, it may be caused by more humid conditions under high temperature. It's also, you know, uh, caused probably by the fact that people are growing more maize, and maize is notorious for transmitting uh, fusarium and scab, so it's affecting the, the other crops. So, you know, I think the answer to your question is we have to bring in more effectively drought tolerance and perhaps salinity tolerance and these other things that are a direct result of, uh, of climate change. But remember that climate change is affecting everything else. So we have to use common sense and, uh, and uh, you know, adjust our priorities accordingly. Okay, thank you. So thank thank you, very you very much. I think you gave us more than a bird eye's view. You gave us a 10 kilometer view. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. You're, yeah. you're welcome. Thank you.